so today's lesson, we have two of them. One is on treatment of subjects, and the other is on margin of error. And we'll go over them both. Okay. So, treatment of subjects. This is in the third unit, statistical studies, and in investigations. Okay. This is very important. This is some of the vocabulary you're going to need to know. There are two ways to categorize data according to its source. If a researcher sources his data from experiments, survey instruments, and observations. If the researcher does it himself and collects the data in that fashion, it's considered primary data. It's primary because he's the primary researcher, okay? Now, not all researchers have to do this to get data. Some researchers simply do what's called finding stuff somewhere else. When collecting primary data, most researchers run a pilot study first. A pilot study is a small-scale version of the research plan. What are some research reasons of re what are some reasons to run a pilot study? Okay, here's a good example of a pilot study. Anybody ever been to Hearn recently? You ever seen the Double Days trailer? You ever bought something from it? No. But you know what food they sell, right? Yes. Why do you think they brought the trailer up there before building a brick and mortar store? They want to see if they actually have enough sales to generate profit. Right? A lot cheaper to throw a trailer up there than, than to build a big brick and mortar store, right? I've never seen anybody over there. I go there. I don't much anymore, but yeah. I don't think it's enough to build a brick and mortar store. Though. Most pilot studies are initiated to test a new market to see if a product will work in the new area. Secondary data is data, our data, that have been collected by someone else and are available to the researcher. The following are examples of this type of data. Here are some examples of that research data. The internet, including websites such as the U.S. Census Bureau and other government sites, Printed materials such as books, almanacs, newspapers, and magazines, and historical documents such as the Bible or history books. Something that's antiquated and considered to be fact by all parties. Notice it didn't say Google. Alright. When using secondary data, part of the research plan must include ensuring that the data are reliable. When collecting primary data, you are responsible for doing everything possible to ensure that your participants are well informed and safe. Now this comes into a whole slew of information we're about to learn that you have to commit to memory because it's very, very important to understand if you're going to conduct research. Now here's the thing. I don't expect you to commit this to memory because I'm pretty sure none of you are going to be researchers. But you are going to research data in your lifetime, I promise you, especially if you run a business. Participants are people who participate as human subjects in human subject research by being the target of observation by researchers. Participants don't necessarily have to be human subjects. They can be animals, plants, potato chips. They can be anything, okay? Most of the time when we talk about keeping people safe, it has to do with human participants. One nice thing about a potato chip study is that researchers do not have to worry about hurting the chips, and the chip's permission is not needed. With human participants, you have to be much more careful, okay? That's what we're coming about treatment of subjects. The National Commission for Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research was created in 1974 in Act of the National Research Act. Its purpose is to identify the basic ethical principles that should underlie the conduct of biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects and to develop guidelines which should be followed to assure that such research is conducted in accordance with these principles. Those principles are very well brought out through A, B, C, and D. A and B are just the titles. Ethical principles and guidelines for research involving human subjects and boundaries between practice and research. But C and D are what I need you to subject to memory. C is the title of it, and B is the what you're doing. So C, one, respect for persons, and the application is informed consent. Okay? Beneficence. 
All it simply means is the assessment of risk and benefits. If you're going to conduct an experiment, you need to make sure you know what are the risks and benefits and you're going to make sure that those people that are going to be participants understand those risks and those benefits. And finally, justice. There needs to be some fair way to select participants. So, for example, let's say that we actually conduct an experiment where we have human participants and we pay each participant $1,000. There has to be a fair way to select participants so that everyone has an equal opportunity to be a part of this research study. Now, however, part of the study may omit people from being in it simply because they're not a good candidate for the study. So, for instance, if they're doing toe fungus and you're not an athlete and you keep your feet pretty clean, chances are you're not going to be selected for the study. That makes sense now, right? That's kind of the point here. What is the informed consent? They're letting you know they're going to conduct an experiment on toe fungus, okay? Assessment of risk and benefits, well, we don't know it's an experimental drug, so it may have some adverse effects on you, but we're going to pay you $1,000. That's the risks and the benefits of doing this particular thing. Selection of subjects, we conducted a survey of possible participants and made sure that we omitted people that we would not get any information from. Now they may actually select, select some people that don't have toe study just to see if they get any improvement and for no reason whatsoever. They're looking for something that's a control group, okay? Alright, so that's it. What we need to understand there are those three parts in two areas. One is the title and the other is the uh, application, alright? Issues related to these guidelines include the protection of vulnerable subjects. Now, this is important. Recruiting volunteers, payment for volunteers, and so on. To ensure that researchers follow the guidelines, research facilities have what we call IRBs, Institutional Review Boards, that must approve all study designs. If a facility does not have its own, it must contact or contract with an outside source. Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration form, performs inspections of IRBs to ensure they are working effectively. Now, notice the highlighted words up there, not just in institutional review boards, but look at the quoted words. Vulnerable subjects. What do you think vulnerable, vulnerable subjects are? Why special cases of human subject need special protection? Why do you think fetuses need to be protected when it comes to research study? Are we morally obliged to take care of life if it has no way to take care of itself? Yeah. How about women? Do women deserve special protection? And if so, why? How about children and minors? Should they be protected when it comes to research? Please. Absolutely. At what age do you think a child would be of consent to be able to make those kind of decisions? 18 is the age that you can vote. That is the age of consent when it comes to making adult decisions. If you're under the age of 18, you have to be protected from your own choices. That's <laughs> true. You can't just do a research study without parental, uh, parental approval. Cognitively impaired persons. What are we talking about when we say cognitively impaired people? Disabled. Huh? Disabled. disabled? Disabled mentally, yes. Well, what do we mean by disabled mentally? Can someone that has Down syndrome make a decision for themselves to be a part of a research group? Yes. No, they do not have the mental capacity to understand all the different risks and benefits involved. That's the deal right there. If you look at any of these fetuses, women, women are only protected to a certain extent because they can make a decision based on the risks and benefits, okay? But fetuses, however, they can't. They can't even answer a question. Children and minors, they don't understand enough. Cognitively impaired people, for the same reason children can't make those decisions, they can't make those decisions. Prisoners, why can't prisoners 
be a part of research study. I want you to think about this hard. It's what we call a captive audience, right? Captive, they can't go anywhere. Here's what happens when you ask a prisoner to be a part of a research study. If the warden asks a group of prisoners to volunteer to be a research study, they get special benefits, right? Wrong. What happens is they feel like if they don't, they might get bad treatment. So psychologically, they are coerced into doing it. So they're not allowed. Prisoners are not allowed to be a part of research study. Or at least they shouldn't be after this particular 1974 treatment. Traumatized or comatose patient. Can they actually say anything? A traumatized person, for instance, let's say a, a, a prisoner that just got back from in-country and he's got PTSD. All right? Post-traumatic syndrome. Stress disorder, whatever you want to call it. Can he make a good, qualified decision for himself based on the risks and benefits of this? Or may he still have some issues behaviorally about it, especially if it's a drug that has to do with antipsychosis? He might be the perfect candidate to get this drug if it was specific for his cause. But I don't think he'd be a great candidate unless he did actually understand what the risks and benefits were involved. And it's kind of hard to when you're having all kinds of psychosis from PTSD. Comatose, they can't even ask the question. They're, they're in a coma. I mean, come on. Terminally ill patients are not good subjects for research. Why? Why would you not ask a terminally ill patient to be a part of a research study? If you knew you were going to die, right? Your decisions would be a lot different than they would if you didn't know you were going to die. If you knew exactly when you were going to die, you would probably live your life a little differently. And that's exactly why they don't allow terminally ill patients to be a part of the study. Unless, of course, it might change the status of their illness. Elderly and aged persons, especially those that are cognitively impaired, we'd have a problem with putting them in researches. Minority students and employees, now, here's the thing. Minorities, it depends. If, the, if, the, if specific diseases are specific to a race that is a minority, that particular study needs to be done with that race only. I can think of one very specific illness, and that's sickle cell anemia, which is pretty much narrowed only to the African American race. I don't know why that is, but it is a physical and true anomaly. That would be very specific for a minority to be a part of that study. White people would not have to be a part of that study. They are not afflicted with sickle cell anemia. It's very rare, but it happens. Students and employees, for the same reason prisoners are not part of studies, if a student okay, or an employee from a college or university was asked to be a part of a research study that was happening at that particular school, it would feel like they would have to do it or they might get bad grades or they might be terminated or might get a pay cut or might get some kind of employment discipline because they didn't do it. it there's coercion that is underlying there that may not be, and it's kind of strange, but that's the whole reason behind you have a special vulnerable candidates that you can't choose from or you shouldn't choose from. You should try to avoid that's the whole point of this whole slide. Protection against identity theft, health insurance, portability, and accountability act, regulations, or accessibility to persons who might not want their identity to be revealed in any way, such as the witness protection programs, custody issues, and illegal residents. Think about this for a second. If you're doing a survey for a research study and it asks you for a name and address, if you're in the witness protection agency, you're not going to want to answer those questions. Not truthfully, anyway, right? Because it might give away where you're being protected. HIPAA. You may not want to give the real answers to your illnesses because it might give away your illness. It's not anybody's business. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It means those people that are in charge have to be very secure with people's illnesses. 
Okay? Custody issues, say you're having a custody issue with your, uh, you're divorcing your husband and he wants to take the kids, that's a, that's a problem that has to be dealt with. Could excluding classes of people from research studies be dangerous? If a class is excluded, we've never learned anything about that study from that particular class of people. If children are excluded from medical research, as often happens, you don't know whether a new medicine can help or harm them. Now. I would hate to find out that we, we didn't do a study with children and we found out later when we tried to give it to them and harmed them, but I'd even feel worse if we never gave it to a child and it would actually help them. How could a survey or questionnaire be dangerous to a participant? Check this out. If the questions are asked that are sensitive in nature, for example, questions about diseases, medical records, criminal records, drug use, and so on, and the confidentiality of the study is breached, the participant could suffer adverse consequences. If it's an adult that's trying to hide from a former boyfriend that was really violent with her, domestic violence, and she's trying to be protected from it, and somehow he hacks into the system and finds out her whereabouts, that study just breached her anonymity or her protected class. A victim of violent abuse needs to be protected. What is informed consent of human subjects and why is it important to a researcher? This is important. It's a big paragraph, but pretty much it sums it up in pretty, pretty well one sentence. Documents that are informed consent must be in a language understandable to participants. So, in other words, just informing someone of the risks and benefits of a study doesn't necessarily inform them unless they can understand what it means. An illiterate person can have the study explained verbally and the consent can be videotaped. In other words, if they can't read or write, you can't get consent from them if you give it to them to read and ask them to sign because they can't neither read nor write. The participants do not waive their rights and must be made aware that participation is voluntary. They can't waive their rights. It has to be volunteer. They must understand the purpose of the research, the procedures, the length of time agreed to, and whether placebos will be used. If so, that they may receive a placebo or an active ingredient or an active treatment. Risks must be thoroughly explained and alternative treatments described. Confidentiality statements must be included and abided by. Participants must know who will answer questions if they have any. Okay? Very important, informed consent protects the volunteer by letting them know the risks and benefits, alternative situations, and what might happen if they do it. What factors should a researcher consider in deciding whether to pay volunteers to participate in the study? This is simple. It is legal for volunteers to be paid for research participation as a recruitment incentive. Some of these studies aren't fun. It is especially common when the health benefits to participants are remote or may not even exist. The amount must be designated in advance, should not be large enough to unfairly influence someone to participate. Participants must be paid even when they withdraw from the study early. So, understand there's all kinds of studies out there. And there's a lot of them around here. Texas a and does a lot of research studies. That's the truth. And they do pay volunteers for it. Here's the thing you must understand. If you're volunteering for a study and you get out of it early, they still have to pay you. That's a true story. If you've taken time away to do part of the study and you can't stay for it all, they still have to pay you for at least a portion of it. I'm going to launch you with this. If you're curious to why there are so many laws regarding research, look at this example of extremely poor treatment of subjects. Okay? This is a long paragraph, but understand why it's important. And I have a link that shows where it comes from. In the years since the beginning of gene therapy, thousands of people have participated in gene therapy experiments. One such person was 18-year-old Jesse Gelsinger. This is a gentleman right here who volunteered to be a part of a study conducted at the University of Pennsylvania. His death early this year was the first reported in the study, and since then the whole study has been halted. Gelsinger had a rare metabolic disease, ornithine, transcarbamylase deficiency, which prevents the body from poorly processing nitrogen. In Jesse's case, said Dr. Healy, the virus 
that was used to carry the gene into the liver to cure his disease and stay again with a huge liver infection. It led to a coma because his body couldn't handle the nitrogen that occurs when a person has a big infection. So it's very important that they understand the risks and benefits of all studies. Even though all these safeguards are intact, this gentleman still passed away from a research study. Okay? So, let's move on to the next lesson. The third lesson, we'll talk about this. Statistically, is it impossible for a sample to sample an entire population of registered voters? So a sample of voters are polled or given a survey of their possible vote. Of course, since only a small portion of the voters were selected to take the poll, it cannot be a precise prediction. Therefore, statistics provides a way to calculate a margin of error for surveys. The margin of error is an amount, usually small, that is allowed for in case a miscalculation or change of circumstances. Okay? Margin of error. Well, what does that mean? Margin of error. What is the margin? The margin by which a sample may be wrong is calculated by st statisticians to give an expert opinion to the results of a surveyed sample of a population. Recall the study from the first lesson that analyzed scalp hair samples from 22 participants with epilepsy and 23 without epilepsy, checking for differences in levels of copper, iron, zinc, magnesium, and calcium. The results summarized in the table below. These are trace elements in micrograms per gram in scalp hair. Notice that they delineate between males epileptic, males non-eleptic, females eleptic, and females non-epileptic. Now, we'll talk about what kind of uh, data that is in a future lesson. If it were possible to measure the presence of copper in the hair of all males with epilepsy in the world, do you think the average would be exactly 14 micrograms per gram? Now, remember in the last one it says the males that were in this study, there was only 14 micrograms per gram in this study. Do you think that's a fair representative of all the males with epilepsy in the world? Let's go back and look how many people they talked about. It says males that were epile epileptic, okay? It didn't even say how many there were. It just says that the males in this study, if you go back to the lesson, you'll see that the study was done in a European, Eastern European country. That's like what they gave us for an answer. Some may believe that 14 is fairly close, while others may think that it could vary widely due to other factors, especially if one remembers the small sample sizes. There's only 22 with epilepsy, 23 without. Some may also point out that 14 is most likely a rounded value anyway. Rounded from what? There's only 22 people we're talking about. Is that fair to legitimize that as the amount of copper per microgram per gram on all people with epilepsy when they're only talking about 22 in the world? A journal article that contains the results of the study actually reports that males with epilepsy have an average of 14 plus or minus 9 micrograms per gram of copper in their scalp of hair. What do you think? 14 plus or minus 9 means in this situation. Braden, what do you think 14 plus or minus 9 means? It could be either one, sir, probably. It could be one, what? It could be either minus or plus. Minus or plus 9 from what? 14? Yes. So the range could be huge. We're talking about a margin of error of 9 on either side of 14. So you can go 14 minus 9, which is only 5, or 14 plus 9, which is 13. You have a range from 5 to 13. That's 8. No, that's 18. Is that right? 9 plus 14 is not 18. 9 plus 14 is 23. 5 to 23, that's an 18-point difference. That's strange. Guess what? If 14 is a number and 18 is a range, that's crazy. That's not accurate at all, is it? should at least perform the computation for 14 minus 9 and 14 plus 9. Get the numbers 23 and 5. You may incorrectly believe that these are the highest and lowest values found in the sample. That's not true. That's a rounded range. <laughs> true story. The plus 
that is called the margin of error, plus or minus number. This wording, however, does not mean that the someone messed up the research. It simply means that no sampling method can guarantee the sample exactly matches the population. Now, you want to know the difference between a sample and a population. Here's the definition of the code. Sample is a portion of the group that is the population, which is all in the group. Okay? Since the males with epilepsy in the sample showed an average of 14 micrograms per gram of copper in their scalp hair, the researchers are fairly confident that the true average copper concentration of all males with epilepsy in the study is between 5 and 23 micrograms per gram. Have you ever seen a news report that mentions margin of error? Anybody ever watch the news report that mentioned the margin of error? especially recently during the election. All the time, right? If you're conducting a poll of registered voters, you have to give a margin of error because there's no way you can poll all registered voters. Especially since polling is voluntary, just like voting is voluntary. Just because people register to vote doesn't mean they're going to vote. Most of you will probably remember hearing political poll results that mention margin of error. Here's an example. Politician Paul and candidate Carl are running for governor. The election is next week. Latest poll shows politician Paul has 46% of the vote, while candidate Carl has 43% of the vote. The news report, however, states that this poll contains a 3% margin of error. What does this mean for politician Paul, who shows to have a three-point lead? Why is it too close to call, Leslie? That's right. The margin of error applies to both candidates. Politician Paul's range is between 49 and 43, and candidate Carl's range is between 46 and 40. So if that 3% of error went towards candidate Carl, he would win 46 to 43. Because three points would be added to candidate Carl, and three points would be taken away from politician Paul. Does that make sense? Very important to understand margin of error. Simply because you have election results that show something, if there's a margin of error, you have to take that into account. 46 plus or minus 3, Paul could actually have as little as 43 and as much as 49% of the vote. Candidate Carl, same way. Okay. What do these poll results tell you about the upcoming election? Upcoming, it's already passed. I apologize. Race is too close to call. Paul could win by as much as 49 to 40 percent, or Carl could win by as much as 46 to 43 percent. Neither person is predicted to obtain 50 percent or more based on this poll, so there's likely to be a runoff. Right? No majority, most elections show to be a runoff. Not the presidential case. Recall the study from the student activity sheet 1, question 19, that tested the effect of replacing rabbit soybean diet with Gorsinia sepium leaf meal, GLM. The rabbits were randomly assigned to receive 0, 5, 10, 15, or 20% GLM. The resulting effect on weight gain is summarized in the table. 0 got a plus or minus 49.58. <coughs> 5% got 887 plus or minus 59. And so on. Increase in weight during an eight week period measured in grams. Okay? Notice the margin of error is very large for 5%. And it's very small for 10%. So, in other words, we have more accuracy in the statistics for the 10% than we do for the 5%. And there's a varying degree of accuracy for each one. So, think about this. Fill in the interval of the true mean weight gain for each treatment based on these results alone. What do you recommend the farmers in the area do? And why? Okay, so 0%. If we're given nothing, 
the true uh, mean weight gain is 958 grams plus or minus 40. So the range is actually from 908 or 918 all the way to 998. And we'll talk about that. All you have to do is plus and minus the amount from the grams of weight gain to find out that range. So let's look at that. The most possible weight gain would be if we gave them 10%. But looking at the range, it has the highest, lowest amount, and almost, and the highest, highest amount. Giving the rabbits the 10% GLM in their diet over eight weeks would have them gain more weight than any other amount. That's what you would suggest to them. Now, this study only talks about weight gain. It doesn't talk about adverse effects. That would have to be a different study now, wouldn't it? A 5% mixture does not seem promising for weight gain, but 10% does. Remember that increasing the concentration of GLM in the rabbit food decreases the cost of the food. Does this change your recommendation? Why or why not? Well, if you reduce it, the more you add GLM, you might get the same amount almost with 15% and reduce the cost of the food. You may even consider going to 20% because even then you would get some weight gain, but not very much, much more than 5%, not more than 15 or 10%. It would probably depend on how much money you got per gram of rabbit, right? To understand the cost of profit is depending on the revenue and the expense. The expense of the food based on how much money you would make on the amount of rabbit. You don't know how much money would be saved. It might be worth it to sacrifice weight gain, 20% GLM versus 10%, if it's saved enough money. All right. When one looks at the election polls prior to the end of the election results, remember that those results are from samples of the voting population and are subject to vast margins of area. Well, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the 2016 election, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Gary Johnson, and Jill Stein. These are all poll results from 2016. This is from June till November, and you can see the actual results shows that Donald Trump was up 46, or uh, Hillary Clinton was up 2% over Donald Trump. That's over the course of six months, though, or five months. We all know who won that election. Poll results are not accurate. You can see from this last election the same thing happened. All right, that's it for the lesson, folks. Be sure to go in and take care of your assignments in the Schoology classroom.